The title of Grand Master was first officially awarded in 1950. Now, in 2017, at the St. Louis Invitational, that tradition continues. Hello chess fans and welcome back to St. Louis for the final day recap for the 2017 St. Louis Invitational. We have had two players, one in the GM section and one in the IM section, that have earned norms and both players have won their respective tournaments. Near the end of today's final round, the top section looked like there would be a five-way playoff, unprecedented here at the St. Louis Chess Club but international master John Michael Burke put a stop to that when he finished off Amon Hamilton, and yes, he had the black pieces, and that means he wins outright. We're here with the winner of the GM Norm section. I'm talking with international master John Burke, who today clinched his second Grandmaster Norm and the tournament victory with a black win against Amon Hamilton. John, you said it was gonna be difficult, and it definitely wasn't easy. Uh, with the black pieces against Amman. Were you aware though that with a draw, you would be involved in a five-way tie for first and a playoff in that manner? I was kind of aware of what was going on with that, but I was too focused on winning because even though winning the tournament is great, I was a lot more uh, focused on getting the norm. It's true, a playoff would not, do, uh, would not earn you the norm. Let's take a look at the game and see exactly how you clinched the tournament. I was kind of lucky that I took a look at the line he played this morning because like five years ago, I think against Jimenez, he played uh, E4 and I was able to uh, notice the move E5 and that was played in that game too. And I think it completely kills the line. In fact, black is already a tiny bit better and that was very helpful for me because it's not easy to create anything with black if your opponent um, wants to draw. And yeah, already it's a bit more pleasant for me. Nothing, you know, too amazing, but I was very happy to, to get this far already. And he has to be a bit careful here. Like if he plays a move like this, then I can invade rook d2, and I think I'm already doing very well. Uh, one of the lines that I looked at was like queen e3. The idea is that if I take on c2, he can take on d8 and then e5. I have f4, and if queen e4, I have this nice move. And I, th I think I'm winning here, because if he takes on f5, then I win the rook on d1. <clears throat> but he played a better move, and now he's threatening to, to play bishop c2, because then I don't have rook d2. So I thought it was a good idea to trade um, and try and leave him with not a bad bishop, but kind of a pinned and a tied down one. And this was a critical moment. If he wanted to make things very interesting, he could have taken the pawn. Because if I take on d3, then he has queen b8 at the end. And I had a couple ideas of what to do. One idea was this line, but I wasn't too happy with it because he can take both my pawns. And I doubt that I have anything here. Maybe I'm a tiny bit better, but probably not a lot. Another thing that I could do is play b5. And then he has a lot of places to move his queen, and the lines are pretty complicated, and I couldn't really figure it out. Honestly, I was pretty tired. But yeah, I was very happy to see queen e2, because then I knew I would get into an end game that, if not winning, was at least very, very close. Yeah, f4 is an important move because if he plays f3, king f2, at the right moment I'll have f4, and that would uh, pretty much win, I think. Yeah, here he, he surprised me by playing rook f1. I thought he would play rook d to e1. Because now if I play as I did in the game, Then he's a full tempo up, and he, he gets his king to c3, and it's a very easy draw. But he was afraid that I'd play like this, but I don't think uh, I really have a whole lot here, because if I, for example, try and invade with my king, then he can play rook e5 and take my f5 pawn. So 
I was kind of relieved that he played Rook F E one. Because now um I got the rook ending and I'm a tempo up on the line that he could have played if he played Rook D E one. Because now if he allows my king to come in. I thought this probably would be winning for me because he can take on f5, but he can't take anything after that, and I can play king a2. And if he comes here, I think I'm more than far enough ahead because I can kick his bishop away and then play king c2. Although looking at it now, it might not be that clear, but no, it probably is because it takes. I'd probably play a5, but yeah, this isn't clear either. Uh, but I think that I would have been winning there uh, with pre precise play. I don't really know how, but I think b4 was the, the right try for him. And now it, it looks completely winning for me, because I'm just going to bring my king to b4 and take on c4. But he has a nice idea, and he found the only move. Uh, because if, for example, he plays like king d2, king b4, then now I can play here. And then it's very easy for me because I'll take both his pawns. And he can't play here because they take and take. And uh, it's a completely winning pawn ending. But yeah, he has this move. Because now if I play king b4, then he can come here and is already probably a draw, because if I defend my pawn, he can defend his. Or if I take on c4 and take, like, for example, this is like the game, but there aren't the pair of pawns uh, left on the board. And that would make this a very easy draw for him, I think, because I can't really bring my king in, because uh, his king will always be able to come in and attack my pawn. Like if I play king a5, he can even play this because if if I take, then his king will take my pawn and then run over, and I'm not winning there. So I thought that the only try would be to take uh, the pawn immediately and then try and run my king in. and. Yeah, from here, from this point on, I mean, we looked at the game afterward. I think we figured out that it was probably winning for black, but it is very complicated, and I'm not 100% positive right now. But I think that he could have maybe started with bishop f3 to force me to move my pawn, because in later lines, I wanted my pawn back on b7. And yeah, I think he wants to keep uh, on the long diagonal anyway. So I was kind of happy to, to see what he did here. And now my plan is just to transfer my bishop to the, the long diagonal. And he can't uh, get his there anymore. Yeah, and he might have an idea of playing like g4, g5 to restrict my pawns. So I thought that I have to play here. And now, for example, if he, has, if he plays this, then I can play here. And he can't take because uh, the pawn ending is hopeless, and otherwise he loses his pawn. Well, technically he can play bishop d1, but yeah, this is why I want my pawn here. And yeah, now the whole idea is that I'm going to try and get my king in, but he'll be able to cut me off, whether it's like if I get to c1, he cuts me off and not let me go to d1, or he doesn't let me to get to b1 to begin with. But either way, I, I have ideas to try and force uh, him away. Yeah, now he has to give ground because he can't play king d2, king b2, and I'll just uh, come in. Or, um, yeah, he has no other move. And now, at, at this point, I got kind of worried because I realized that he has bishop d5, and I completely missed that for whatever reason. Um, if he takes my, uh, if he trades, then it looks like he has uh, 
enough to keep me up, but I can run all the way over, and then he has to give ground. But yeah, I think this was a better try, because we'll get what we got in the game, but a full tempo up for him, and that might be enough to draw. Because I have to come here to defend both my pawns, but now he has time to bring his king over, and he can cut me off here too, and I can't get in. And we were looking at ideas uh, of bringing the king back and uh, trying to win from there, but it's very, very difficult. Like for example, if he plays waiting moves, then I can't do anything over here. And my only other idea would be to try and bring one of my pieces back around. But if I like bring my bishop around, then he can come after my pawns, and I might even lose there. So I don't know. It's, it's very complicated, and I have to be very careful. And if there is a win, then it's very difficult. But luckily, he didn't realize that we would get that later in the game, but a tempo up for me. He thought he could uh, avoid that. But now, now I think I'm winning, because he doesn't have enough squares uh, on the diagonal. Now, the idea is that if he goes here, then I can trade and I'm completely winning. This is a better try, but I win anyway because I can cut him off like that. And then again, he has to give ground because if he goes bishop f1, then I go king d1 or king d3, king b2. And I bring my king back and I win his c4 pawn. He had to go after my pawn, but now I'm luckily a tempo up on the line from before because now he doesn't have the two moves to bring his bishop to the long diagonal like he did in the other line. And so now I'm completely winning. The only trick is that I have to be uh, a bit careful. If I take the pawn immediately, and I think this is still winning, because, but even though uh, my king is cut off, I can play here now, and I'm threatening to bring my king out. King out. And king f3, I can uh, come behind. And if he lets me play bishop d3 to e4, then I'll get my king out. And if he takes the pawn, then this is completely winning because I'm going to run my two pawns to distract him. And if he goes after them, then I can get my king out and run my other pawn. But I didn't even have to do that because I can play here, and he has nothing to do but wait. And now I can defend my pawn. And now. He has to play another waiting move, but then I can even just bring my bishop out and uh, and I want to play bishop e4, and if bishop d5, I think I can just come behind now because I'm threatening to take his pawn and there's not a lot he can do about it. Maybe he can go here anyway and that would transpose. Ah, uh, no, if he takes on f5, then I can bring my king out. And if king f2, then I can defend it. So yeah, I didn't even need the line from before where I go after his c4 pawn. But even though that would be winning too, it was not the time that I wanted to calculate because he had low time as well. So yeah, I think his critical um, error was not taking the opportunity to activate uh, his bishop earlier with... Uh, with bishop d5, uh, not here, but wherever it was. Yeah, here. And yeah, I don't know, it might just be a draw. Maybe I have a computer-like win, but if there is one, then I couldn't find it. So I was very relieved that he didn't play that. Yeah. Well, at the end, you guys were both really low on time. Now, there is a 30-second increment. Does that do anything to relieve the pressure of that end game? A little bit because it, then it's the type of endgame where I can, if I want to, just mo make a couple of random moves and I'll, I'll be fine. So if I really like had to gain time uh, in that manner, then I could have. But yeah, even with the increment, I was a bit worried. Ben Feingold, always repeat. Uh, yeah. Well, you have two norms now. Is the third one immediately in your crosshairs? No, I don't even know the next uh, norm tournament I'm playing. I'm just going to go back home and relax. Who knows, it might be here. 
Anything else uh, you'd like to add as we congratulate you on your victory? Not really. I'm kind of tired, to be honest. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we still have a big dinner and, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Congratulations, John Burke, on his second GM Norm. Let's take a look at the final standings for the top section here at the Invitational. Five and a half points. That saw all of these players tied for second place. So they each take home $1,000, which is the combined prizes of second through fifth place divided by four. International Master John Michael Burke has two Grandmaster Norms to his name, and he is the winner of the GM Norm section of the Invitational. He takes home $2,000. The IM Norm section wasn't as easily decided as Justin Wang and International Master Torres both drew their games, bringing them to six and a half, which meant that the two players would engage in a playoff, blitz style. All right, welcome to the uh, 2017 St. Louis Invitational Playoffs. We have a uh, tie in the uh, I am Norm section with International Master Torres and National Master Justin Wang. He actually got his first international master norm. So congratulations, Justin. And now we will play the playoffs. But before the playoffs, we will do a drawing of the lots. They will play two games, game in five minutes, with a three second increment. Congratulations to Justin Wang. He won the, uh, the International Master uh, Norm. He won the uh, section as well, and a check for $1,200. So give it up for our National Master Justin Wang. It took two games in the playoffs, but we have the clear-cut winner right here. The winner of the International Master Norm field is the one and only Justin Wang. Justin, congratulations on your victory today. I know that you thought that you might have to end up playing uh, I am Torres in a playoff, and that's indeed what happened. First thoughts here. You just got done with these games moments ago, went two straight, 2-0 two and o to win this playoff. How do you feel right now? I feel pretty happy. But let's see how it happened. Take us through the game. I know in the first game, it was a blitz game, five minutes with a three-second increment, and you had the black pieces. Take us through and show us what happened. Okay, so one first cr critical moment here was knight e3. Uh, my position was had some holes in it, but I think I could. But he has an isolated pawn, so I could take advantage of that. Queen, I think queen d8 just queen d8 is just safe, this, and I could keep an advantage. But unfortunately, I played b4, then he played bishop b5, and then now if queen d8. It weakens the g4 square, then he can maybe bishop do bishop g6. So after knight g4, queen h5, f3, rook c6. Rook, I played, this was bad, but I played it because I wanted to play f6. And I couldn't, couldn't have played it one move earlier because he can do something like this. And then I lose even more material. So now after bishop e4, my position is bad. And bish, queen b5 is also possible. P planning to play queen d7, but bishop d5 is also okay. After here, bishop, F bishop f6 is a bad move. He, because I just played bishop f8 and he has no knight fork. I think h3 here just better, is just better. My queen cannot really move anywhere, and my rook doesn't do anything. So all of my pieces are in, in the position are stuck. If I play bishop c4 here, I can go rook c1. He, he does this. If I do here, he forks my queen. So after, he, after king h1, bishop c4, queen e1 loses. If queen c2, I can play bishop a6. But rook c1 is the saving move. 
Then after bf e2, rook xc8, king h7, knight takes. Then here, the only way to stop mate is g5, where rook j taking my queen is drawn. So after queen e1, he is already lost. In, in the next game, the first critical moment was when he played rook fc8. May, maybe just bishop d3, probably a better move, or just rook g1. But played bishop c4, and now he sacrifices rook. After knight b2, he played rook d8, which was bad. He probably didn't see my queen d8. Next, he, I, think, I think his best move is just queen xe4. So after queen d8, I, I just got a, I got a good position, but I kind of lost it. And then at the end, he gave up his knight for nothing. And that was it. He resigned. International master Torres, Luis uh, Torres, goes down and has to settle for second place after that playoff. Justin, you're not a bad blitz player. Uh, do you enjoy blitz in uh, your free time? Yeah, kind of. I play online. Yeah, it, with a with an increment like that, that was bo bonus for you. Not really. <laughs> Maybe I would was better off without increment. Do you have any up, big upcoming tournaments that you plan on participating in? Uh, I'm gonna play some tournament in my state right after this tournament, but it's not. It's in a chess club, so maybe not very big. You're 12 years old. When we talk to players who are that young, who are coming up in the chess world as quickly as you are, the question is, where do you see yourself in your chess future? How far do you think you'll go? I don't know. Depends how hard I work. And hopefully I could become world champion or something. That's a tremendous... Maybe top 10. That's a tremendous uh, uh, expectation to have for yourself, and I commend you for that. Justin, congratulations one more time. It was great talking to you. The winner. Thank you. You're welcome, man. You're welcome. Great guest here, Justin Wang. One of the guys to keep your eyes on in the chess world, and he is the winner of the International Master Norm event. Tied for third place in the I Am Norm section, Matthew Larson, Aaron Grabinski, and Vitaly Namer. These players each take home $600. It took a playoff to stop international master from Mexico, Luis Torres. He takes home $1,000 for his efforts in this event. And the phenomenal Justin Wang takes home this entire tournament after clinching a norm one round early. 12-year-old Justin says someday he'd like to be the world champion. He takes home $1,200 for this performance in the Invitational. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube, Chess24 and USChessChamps.com for the coverage of the 2017 St. Louis Invitational. Congratulations once again to Justin Wang and international master John Burke. Until next time, this is Ben Simon saying so long from the Show Me State.